Hi there. We started to talk about d uh, data format or types of attributes that um, can be used inside of Weka in class um, on Tuesday of week three, but there's a little bit more technical detail that could be discussed, especially how this maps onto the Weka data file format, which is called ARFF, and you need to be a little bit familiar with that. And um, at different times, you'll have questions about that. So I'm posting this video as a resource for you. So we talked about how there are four basic types. Nominal, which is where there are discrete categories um, that are values for an attribute. Numeric, where the values are numbers, and those can be integers or real values. Date, which could be something like January 24th, 1979, or May 31st, 1970, for example, or string, um, which can be some arbitrary text. So here's what the internal format of uh, data that's stored inside of Weka looks like. Um, so if you saved, so we've looked at these things in tabular form, um, where we have a row per data point, we have a column for every variable. Here it looks a little bit different. Um, so um, at the very top, we have a line that says at relation and the name of the data set. Underneath that, we have four rows, which are um, our attributes. And for each one, we have the name. And after that, depending upon the type, we have some additional information. And um, then underneath that, we have at data. And then every line underneath that is one line of data. And you can see how the values are separated by commas. And the values um, are in the same order as the attribute list. This is called the ARFF format. It's the Weka native data file format. So for numeric attributes, these are continuous. It's a, a continuous range. The value can be any integer or real value. The format of um, a declaration for a numeric attribute is at attribute, then the name, which might be temperature, and then it says numeric. And then um, in the data portion of the file, um, then the actual number that is the value of that feature for that particular row, um, which is an instance in the data set, is given. And it can be any real number or integer. And what's nice about numeric attributes is that they allow for um, an ordering in a distance. What do I mean by that? Well, 5 is less than 7, but it's greater than 3. So the order would be 3, 5, 7. And 3 is further away from 7 than it is from 5. So you see here order and distance. And order and distance are important for some kinds of learning. If we want to say that age predicts how much time you spend do doing homework, then the older you are, the more homework you do. And if you're much older, you do much more homework. And if you're much younger, you do much less. Nominal is different. These are categorical. Um, these have a discrete set of values. Whereas for a continuous um, numeric attribute, there are infinitely many possible values. Um, for something like Outlook, as we have seen in our Play Tennis data set, it has only three values. So that means that attribute has to have either sunny, overcast, or rainy as the value. So they're pre-specified. And when that attribute is declared in the header of an ARFF file, then you start out with add attribute, then the name of the attribute, and then in curly braces, we have the list of possible values. And the order here of the values is important only because internally in Weka, it actually represents those values as numbers. But even though it does that, when it's reasoning about this attribute, it doesn't consider that there is actually an order. So it won't consider that overcast is greater than sunny, for example. It only considers that overcast is different from sunny. So every machine learning model that's learned with an attribute that's nominal um, will treat that attribute as a comparison of, is it exactly this value, or is it some other value, and not you know, 
what's the order of sunny, overcast, and rainy, or how much different is rainy from sunny. Rainy is just as different from sunny as overcast is from sunny, as far as any model is concerned inside of uh, Weka, um, if it's, you know, if we consider our outlook to be nominal. For strings, we can have an arbitrary text, like, look, mom, no hands. Um, now, what will happen is that in a model that's trained using variables that are declared as type string, um, they'll be treated as though they're nominal. So every string value is different from every other string value, which is not very useful. But we might want to load um, variables into Weka that are strings, and then we can use filters to extract features from those strings. So um, if you have text, though, you should actually use light side to do your extraction. That's just, it's simpler. Uh, Weka does have some filters for extracting features from strings, but it's very clunky to use. So I'm pointing it out for um, completeness, but if you are in this situation where you have some string variables, I wouldn't use Weka to do the extraction. I would use light side, and I just posted a supplementary video about setting up your data um, for Weka using light side. Date is the final uh, one of these attributes, and its format in the header is at attribute, then the name, then the type, which is date, and then a string which tells you how to parse that. And so these letters, capital Y, capital M, small d, um, capital H, small m, small s, these stand for year, month, day, hour, minute, and second. And so here it's specifying that the year is going to be the four digit format, that there will be two digits for month, that there will be two digits for day, two digits for hour, two digits for minute, and two digits for second. Um, and a different format could, so you can see that T, that capital T, um, it's just there, um, it will, there will be a T in the string. You could, it could have been left out, the dashes could have been left out the colons from the time could have been left out. Those are added into this format string. And basically what this says is that when a date is in the raw data file and you read it into Weka, it can find the year, month, day, hour, minute, and second, and it's gonna turn it into an integer. And so for dates, uh, because it gets transformed into this numeric attribute, um, you can, look at how dates are ordered and the distance between dates. Next month is further away than tomorrow, um, but yesterday is earlier. And um, it can reason in that way because it transforms the date into an integer. Okay, so here is an R file. You can see it has the same format as the one that we looked at in a previous uh, slide but it's a different data set. So you have a different set of attributes. We've got three attributes. One of them um, is nominal, and its value is last week or next week. That's what we're gonna try to predict. Then we've got a string version of the date. So we're just treating it. Um, here you can see we're treating it like it's nominal, actually, and that because we have the curly braces and then we have each possible value enumerated. And then uh, we have day, which is of type date, and we have the format string. So what will happen when Weka reads this in? It's going to create the nominal attribute, which is period. Then it will have a string variable. Well, it's nominal, and every one of these dates is going to be treated as a unique value, which is not very useful, but might be useful as documentation because when it reads in the final one, which is of type date, it's going to transform the date into a number. So inside of Weka, if you open up an instance to see what were the values for all of the features, you'll see the number that corresponds to the date, but you won't know what day that was. You won't be able to go backwards from the integer that's created um, out of the date to the date in the form that we're used to seeing it. And so that's why it's useful to also have um, the day string um, version of it, which is just going to mostly be there so that you can see what was that date anyway. Now, if I load this in, then I can um, 
run our decision tree learning algorithm on it, and you can see the tree that would be learned over the data set um, that I just showed you to the right. And you can see that it's splitting on day, and you can see the value where it splits. That's what happens when it reads um, this date format and turns it into an integer. And if you look at it, like I said, it's not very meaningful. And that's why it's useful that, you know, so if you were going to look at which instances um, were classified as this week versus last week, and you want to be able to understand them, um, you will want to see it in the form that you understand. And that's why we preserved the, the date form um, in the day string variable. And, and here you can see it. If you look at um, the visualized classifier um, errors um, interface, we can see um, if we look at um, the class value, which is on the y-axis, and then we look at and the, what it did with day, which is the one variable that it's classifying based on, you can see um, that, uh, it, again, the range is in terms of a number that's hard to interpret. But if you click on one of these boxes or X's, you can open up the, um, uh, the instance and see the attribute value pairs. And you can see that you know we have day string in there. That helps us to see um, what each of these days actually is. Now what's interesting here is you can see X's correspond to instances that were correctly classified. Boxes represent instances that were incorrectly classified. We only see one box, and it's right smack dab in the middle. And what does that mean? It means that um, when it learned the separation between last week and next week, it placed it in just a slightly wrong place. And it did that because of the training data, um, uh, it didn't have that one instance that it then used as test data and that it then got wrong. Um, and so it had to place the boundary someplace. If there was no instance there um, to show it where the boundary actually was, it could be off just a little bit. And so then those instances close to the boundary in time uh, could be classified incorrectly. That's exactly what we see here. So it makes sense where we're seeing errors and um, we can interpret uh, our instance because we have that day string variable. Now, um, Weka has nominal attributes where you, you can see difference, but not order and distance, and numbers where you can see order and distance, but there are infinitely many distinctions to be made. And we talked in class about how it is that you can transform a numeric uh, attribute into a nominal one. So here you can see that we have uh, a, a numeric attribute, it has a range. Here we see the lowest value is 0.2 and the biggest value is 0.63. And we've divided it, the range, into four segments and we've uh, associated each segment with a nominal value. And so we've turned a numeric attribute into a nominal one and that one doesn't have order and distance. We can just say A is different from B, it's different from C. We can't see that C is greater than A. But if we wanted to be able to uh, have a decision tree where it sent everything that's less than uh, a particular value to one side and everything that's greater than it to the other side, then we can fake that reasoning by creating some new attributes. So let's say we had A um, and then we had another one that's A or B. So it's true if, a, if, if the value is A or if the value is B or another one that's true if the value is A or B or C and another one that's a, true if A or B or C or D. Now, uh, wherever we want to make a split, let's say we want to learn a tree that says, um, you know, anything that's less than um, uh, 0.355, um, to the left and everything greater to the right. We can do that by saying um, if it's A or B, left, otherwise right. And so um, that allows us to learn that A and B is less than C or D. And so in some sense, we're faking the reasoning that you would do with ordinal values using a different encoding of the, these nominal values. So. You can do that um, often in uh, Weka or other, other kinds of 
uh, packages you might work with. They might not natively give you all of the power that you want, but you can often fake it with some kind of indirect strategy. And this is just one example of a kind of feature in coding that allows you to have a kind of reasoning that's not made easy with um, you know, just the raw kind of data types that you have. Okay, so that's a nice introduction to the ARFF format and the kinds of variables that are inside of Weka. And um, I'm going to also create another uh, video that's about working with ARFF files.